Not many were aware that Jose Ferrer was making Oscar history at the 23rd Annual Academy Awards in 1951. Most eyes were on Betty Davis and Gloria Swanson who were nominated for All About Eve and Sunset Boulevard, respectively. However, we now look at that night as the first time an actor from Latin American heritage took home the coveted award. And as of 2020, the only time a Hispanic or Latinx actor has taken the award in a leading acting category. Sadly, no actress has won yet. But there are a few things to consider into this win. 1. This night almost didn't happen. 2. It was a silent victory for the Latinx and Hispanic community. And 3. It didn't materialize into a successful career for Ferrer. Let's break this down. As Ferrer was being handed the Oscar, well, he wasn't really being handed, actress Helen Hayes was holding on to the award as Ferrer was at the other side of the country in New York City alongside the other big winner of the night, Judy Holliday, who won for Best Actress, and Gloria Swanson, who the two of them were rehearsing for a play that would both star an end. Around the time, Ferrer was being investigated by the House of Un-American Activities Committee, the Hwag for possible connections to communism. This was of course in the midst of the Cold War and the frenzy over the perceived threat by communists in the US, which became as the Red Scare. Hwag often pressured witnesses to give up names and other information that could lead to the apprehension of communists, as they had already generated the infamous blacklist of entertainers considered unemployable due to their communist leanings deemed as morally wrong. Have you seen Trumbo? An issue from Variety on March 14 of 1951, 15 days before the Oscars, the treasurer of the Extreme Right Wing Motion Picture Alliance for the Preservation of American Ideals, War Bond, said that Ferrer is a great actor, but he should not represent the motion picture business. He should not be paid the highest owners of the industry, he said. Around the time, Ferrer was also to receive a certificate of merit from the Californian Teachers Association, which represented around 3,000 educators. But the plan to represent a certificate was cancelled, as Bond told the association that it shouldn't honor an actor who supported and associated with subversive organizations. Bond added that if the Academy were to give the award to Ferrer, Sanjaf, who was nominated for Best Supporting Actor that year, and Judy Holliday for Best Actress, it would indicate that the Academy membership is either sound asleep or sympathetic to people of that group, people who were openly known to be sympathetic to subversive elements, he said. And he took it as far as writing a letter to William Randolph Hearst over a painting that appeared in the Sunday pictorial review of the Los Angeles Examinator, showing Ferrer, Mala Powers, and William Prince in a scene from Cyrano saying that the picture will help this man win the Academy Award. Ferrer was an advocate for several progressive causes. According to scholar Kristen Hunt, Ferrer fought against segregation, attended crisis meetings on atomic energy and foreign policy, and signed a letter in 1947 condemning the House of an American Activities Committee. Ferrer started to appear on rent channels, suggesting implicitly to studio executives and directors not to hire him. Hunt added, The dichotomy of this moment both a coronation and a threat perfectly encapsulated Ferrer's uneasy place in Hollywood, where he was often considered too left-wing, too snobby, too difficult. Even Hedda Hopper had father to write about Ferrer. As the history professor Jennifer Frost writes, Hopper bolstered the Hwag proceedings with many anti-communist columns. Ferrer was just one of her targets. In response to the subpoena and communist accusations, Ferrer said, I attest that I will swear on the oath and that I am not, have never been, and could not be, a member of the Communist Party. Trade publications at the time speculated that this red paranoia would have an influence at the Oscars and cost Ferrer the award. Ultimately, when Ferrer testified in front of the Hua Committee, he recognized that some of the organizations he had supported had red ties and that he hadn't done his homework researching them thoroughly. Drama professor Emilia S. Berenger, in her biography of actress and producer Margaret Webster, 
says that Ferrer avoided being blacklisted by giving up four names. Jose Ferrer provided little information at first and was sent back away to refresh his memory. Three days later, he returned with four names. Serrano de Vajarg was a role Ferrer knew very well. In his lifetime, he played it numerous times, first on stage becoming the first person to ever win a Tony Award for Best Actor in a play for his performance in 1947. Then he went on to play Serrano in the 1950 film version and a decade later in a French film version in 1964, a production of the same title. In addition to a TV movie in 1956 for which he was nominated for a Primetime Emmy Award for standing lead actor in a miniseries or movie. Serrano de Vajarg is a French play written in 1897 and, you guessed it, French. It's about a man named Serrano who has an abnormal big nose, but who is also a gifted individual with words and poetry. Yet he feels no woman could ever love him because of his unconventional looks. He is secretly in love with Roxanne, but convinces his rival Christian, a good-looking man, to end Roxanne's heart using Serrano's poems and speeches. It's a love story about the love for words and the power of words. The characters wrestle with their own insecurities and the idea that they are not good enough. To play Serrano on Broadway, according to a Times article, it says that Ferrer spent three months fence training at the Salle Santelli. Then, as he learned that he was going to start in the movie version, he took on training once again. The director of the film, Michael Gordon, said, While I was fencing with one hand, he was fencing with both, right and left-handed. He's no megalomaniac. I have to say that Ferrer as Serrano is able to be dramatic, funny, vulnerable, transformative. He recites every war like a Shakespearean. It is perhaps the role he was born to play. Early in his life, Ferrer was the extremely accomplished son of a wealthy Puerto Rican family. They moved to the United States mainland when Ferrer was six. He fenced, played piano at the concert level, and got into Princeton at the age of 14, where he and a tall man named Jane Stewart, another of the nominees that night, play in the same jazz band. Ferrari reported that Ferrer spoke five languages. Aside from English, he would give interviews in French, Spanish, Italian, and German, and that he even went on to do postgraduate work in French at Princeton and study aspects of the Belgian novel at Columbia. How's that for an overachiever? After college, Ferrer began working in theater, building experience as a stage manager in Suffern before transitioning to Broadway. He found early success in a 1940 production of the comedy Charlie's Aunt, but it was his turn as Iago in a 1943 production of Othello that made him a true star. He broke into Hollywood five years later with his performance as Dauphin in the 1948 production of Joan of Arc and received his first of three Academy Award nominations. Aside from the communist scandal, the critics' money was on Ferrer that year. Variety reported a day before that a tabulation of poll votes predicted that the top acting awards would go to Judy Holliday and Jose Ferrer. The nominees that night for Best Actor were Louis Conger for The Magnificent Yankee, Jose Ferrer for Cyrano de Vajarc, William Holden for Sunset Boulevard, Jane Stewart for Harvey, and Spencer Tracy for Father of the Bride. Another paper claimed that the award would go to Ferrer, saying, his strongest opposition is expected to come from Jane Stewart, who delighted audiences as the easygoing pal of the non-existent Harvey, and Louis Conger, whose Oliver Wendon Holmes ran the bell in The Magnificent Yankee. The Boston Globe predicted Ferrer too, saying, Mel star performance, this one's a little easier to chart, provided the race runs to form. Jose Ferrer's grandiose Serrano de Vajari was one of the biggest chunks of acting in years. He should, if you will pardon the expression, win by a nose. That doesn't mean the feel will not oppress him. Louis Colhorn created a charming portrait of Justice Oliver Wendon Holmes in The Magnificent Yankee, but the film itself does not seem strong enough to bring home a winner. William Holden might qualify as a dark horse. His able convincing work as a screenwriter helped hold Sunset Boulevard together, but his role lacked Ferrer's fireworks. Jane Stewart, Harvey, and Spencer Tracy, Father of the Bride, figure to be outrun. Both are former Derby winners, Tracy Trump twice, but they have seen in more solid stuff. Another newspaper also classified Ferrer as the log winner and Holden as the dark horse. Although even Holden thought the award would go to Ferrer, saying days prior to the ceremony, 
I feel that Ferrer with that performance at Serrano is in line for it. For myself, I am delighted to be among the contenders, I love my part of Joel Gills and the picture, and will criticize only myself for not doing a little better. Soon after he took the award, he said, From the bottom of my heart, I thank you for what I consider a both of confidence and an act of fate. And with the looming date to speak in front of the Hua committee, he added, And believe me, I will not let you down. But as I said earlier, this was sort of a silent win for the Hispanic and Latinx community that can only be appreciated in retrospect. As Brian Eugenio Herrera described Herrera's win in his book Latin Numbers playing Latino in 20th century US popular performance, it was also the only occasion in the 20th century when a Latino was recognized as best actor or best actress, a distinction Ferreira held into the second decade of the 21st century. But Ferreira's status as the first Latino to win an Oscar, however conspicuous in historical retrospect, occasioned little comment in 1950. You can say Joaquin Finis is the second actor, having been born in San Juan, Puerto Rico, but his parents don't have a connection to Puerto Rico, and he does not consider himself Latinx. One of the reasons there was little mention is that back in the 50s, there was no blanket term that collectively referred to either Hispanic people, meaning people who were born in a country where the official language is Spanish, that includes Spain, or Latinx, which most people know as Latin or Latino, and it refers to anybody born in Latin America or a Caribbean country, including Brazil, where the official language is Portuguese. In the 1950s, Puerto Ricans were known as Puerto Ricans, Cubans were known as Cubans, Mexicans were known as Mexicans or Chicanos, Mexican-American, you get the idea. The terms Hispanic or Latino are barely, if any, used in Latin America or anywhere outside of the US. The term Hispanic was adopted later in the 70s when an ad hoc committee on racial and ethnic categories was trying to come up with an efficient method to collect information and share statistics that could prove that people of Latin American descent had low degrees of social mobility and high levels of disenfranchisement. An anonymous article published on the Huffington Post written by someone who participated in the creation of this term said, For years I witnessed as these persons were denied their voting and their housing rights and their educational and job opportunities pull away in favor of others. The only way to ensure that these people weren't continued to be forgotten and dismissed was to show statistics that could prove their low standing in the American social strata. To this end, the term Hispanic seemed the only that would be inclusive of all persons of Spanish descent and which in turn will count this population group accurately. The many terms the committee toyed with were Spanish-speaking, Spanish surname, Latin American, Latino, and Hispanic. And as you know, we ended up with two terms that, although it generalizes several other groups and tribes within the Latinx and the Hispanic community, who for different reasons speak other languages among other differences, it also covered a big percentage of the population that was immigrating to the U.S. back then and even now. So this night's victory was initially a sense of pride mostly to the Puerto Rican community. Five hours after receiving the award, Ferrer presented it to the Chancellor of the University of Puerto Rico, Jaime Benitez, as a permanent trophy. And on April 15 of the same year, Ferrer paid a visit himself to the Governor Luis Muñoz Marín at the governor's residence, La Fortaleza. The governor praised the actor and implicitly addressed Ferrer's communist scandal, saying, My regard for him is the same that I have felt all my life for the humble, generous, and unselfish man, like all soldiers fighting against communism in Korea and our peasants fighting against poverty in the ridges of the soil of Puerto Rico. From the get-go, Ferrer swiftly became a character actor rather than a movie star. When he passed away in 1992, the Times referred to him as cerebral and idiosyncratic actor, and in his early years, Brooks Atkinson, drama critic for the Times, said, Ferrer is the most able, stimulating, and the most versatile actor of his generation in America. In a time when Hollywood ignored the positive contributions of Hispanic Americans to life and culture in the U.S., and instead emphasized stereotype after stereotype of Latinx people, depicting them as criminals, low life, exuberating their sensuality, being dancers or dancers in distress, and incapable of carrying the lead roles, Ferrer was an invisible actor, which afforded him to take on a range of roles that more conspicuous, right-in-your-nose Latinx actors would not have had the chance to. 
from Iago in Othello to Charlie's Aunt in Charlie's Aunt, Dauphin in Joan of Arc, and much later in his career he played the short stature Henry toulouse Lautrec in Moulin Rouge, Alfred Dreyfus in I Accuse, and let's not even mention the reason we are here, which is Cyrano. However, Brian Eugenio Herrera points out to a certain trend that was occurring with Latinx actors at the time. Additional screening of this minor mid-century explosion of Latino and Latina actors at the Oscars reveal additional animalities. In particular, Latino and Latino actors were nominated for both Latin and non-Latin roles. Puerto Rican Jose Ferrer's nominations for the Oscars all came for his portrayals of elite French men. The casting practices of the 1950s cued the pivot from the established tradition of mimicry toward an emerging regime that purported to prioritize congruity. Actors were exposed to play more than on a particular line of business, which might include a selection of many ethnic impersonations popular. Actors could list in their resume among their specialities that they could play types. Ereta writes, Within such structure, racially and ethnically specific characters were usually considered stock characters or types. That actors might portray, provided their impersonations displayed the expected physical, vocal, and visual techniques of racial mimicry. Latinx, on the other hand, contingent to the actor's physical features and abilities, which, as you may know, it varies given that they are Afro-Latin Americans, Asian Latin Americans, mestizos, white, and indigenous. Latin America's multiculturalism is so eclectic and so not one-size-fits-all. Herrera describes Latinx in the spirit of Hollywood as the Stel Latino, in which performances exploit the uncertain and mixed raciality of Latino and Latina performers to amplify themes of racial distinction, legibility, and violation that are central to the dramatic narrative being performed. Latin X actors took otherized roles, playing characters that were something more than black or white. Although they play African Americans, they took indigenous, Middle Eastern, Asian, and Jewish roles too. The body of work of the Latinx actor was racialized, perhaps, by the actor's body itself, Herrera writes. Ferrer might or might not be the exception. As Herrera said, all of his Academy Award nominations were in fact distinguished for playing a lead French man, and he barely played any non-racialized lead characters. In an essay titled Latin Looks in Hollywood Over Time, it states that, in the 1950s, the few roles available were often victims incapable of defending themselves, vixens, alien invaders, and young punks. Therefore, many of the images that we see in this period were Latin lovers, bombshells, spitfires, and sultry Latinas, and victims saved by wise saviors. In essence, there were fewer roles open to Latino actors, and many of these were cliché roles. Exceptions included Rosaura Revueltas, in the now classic indie film South of the Earth and the exceptional Jose Ferrer, some actors became victims of McCarthyism. Some argue that in Ferrer's case, he wasn't the rule but the exception. Even in today's Hollywood, male actors with a diverse ethnic background find themselves assimilating and concealing parts of their identity with the hope that they'll be considered for other non-Latino specific roles, which honestly you can't blame them for. Take for example Oscar Isaac, an actor whose parents are Guatemalan and Cuban. In real life, his full name is Oscar Isaac Hernández Estrada, with two accent marks. Those are all gone when he registered his artistic name, and so are his two very Hispanic surnames. In an essay titled Keanu Reeves vs. Oscar Isaac, Ambiguous Race in Film by Vera Davis, Davis writes, he likely uses the stage name Isaac to separate himself from his Latin American heritage. His stage name has probably helped him get roles that are not at all connected to a Latin American identity, such as Lewin Davis in Inside Lewin Davis or Nathan in Ex Machina. It could be argued that without the name change, Isaac would not have gotten these roles and instead will be typecast into the roles of his early career. An article talking about Ferrer's career says, some people have suggested that his name might have been too foreign sounding for American audiences. But then, as he pointed out, if that had been the case, he'd never made it big in the first place. The question remains perhaps an answer. Why did Ferrer's career lost its luster so soon? In the 1950s, 
The Times reported that Ferrer struggled to find consistent work and at one point going through what he describes as a four-year film famine. He said to the newspaper, Go to anyone in Hollywood, even now, and ask them how come they did not use me for some picture they made, and I can tell you what they'll say. They'll say, Oh, he's a stage personality, he's box office poison, he's too intellectual, he's an egghead, he's an arrogant, he's a egomaniac. Nobody once asked me to act in a movie in four years. I made no secret that I was willing to act in movies. The reality is that Hollywood did think many of these things about Ferrer. The Times ran a profile days before he took home the award for Best Actor, saying that Ferrer was offered the lead role in the film Androgles and the Lion. It was an offer of $100,000 plus percentage of the world gross, which was described as an arrangement previously unheard of even in Hollywood, the paper wrote. His agent suffered a psychomaniac loss of voice after hearing that Ferrer was not going to sign because he was committed to his play in Broadway alongside Gloria Swanson. If he signed, it would signify closing down the play or looking for a replacement, which Ferrer refused to do. The stage was where he trained and became the actor he was known for. He was a dedicated actor and money was not his compass when it came to choosing parts. That same Times profile describes Ferrer as a man who has not kept up with himself financially, at least not in comparison with a number of other stars. He even got into debt staging the production of Serrano on Broadway, which, despite its critical success, was not a financial success, owing $75,000. His projects after his last commercial success, The Community, drew little interest from major audiences and critics. His other most famous role is a small appearance in the 1962 Best Picture winner Lawrence of Arabia, in which he played Turkish Bey. Initially unsatisfied by the short part and demanding more money than even the start of the show himself, Peter O'Toole, he let her say, If I was to be judged by any one film performance, it would be by my five minutes in Lawrence. Some argue that it took a while for Ferrer to understand priorities in Hollywood. As Ferrer used to also direct and produce for theater and film, it could be said that he overspose himself, trying to be like Orson Welles at producers and studio heads, stop perceiving him as the versatile character actor that he distinguished himself to be early in his career. The Times wrote, The other half gets nervous and wonder whether Ferrer isn't spreading himself too thin. He has got to learn the difference, one of them said severely the other day, between the main chance and the main line. Joe makes tremendous demands on life and of course he displaces tremendous amount of cubic space. But he's spending three times as much of himself as he's getting back. Why does he have to prove anymore on a rational basis? Why does he have to be a toe dancer too? His gift is rare and important enough for someone to stick and stick in in that will and stop it spinning. Who the hell else is there around? For his time, Ferrer was rather advanced. Hollywood had barely seen versatile actors the like we see today. The most versatile actors that I can think of of this era was Betty Davis and Laurence Olivier, but they were exceptions and not the rule. Most actors had one on-screen persona which they would play variations of time after time after time. It seemed to work for a few such as Catherine Hepburn, Cary Grant, and Jane Stewart, among others. The trio were in the Philadelphia story, by the way. Ferrer was adamant not to play that formula. He was transformative and didn't let his own personality dictate the role he was playing. It could also be pointed out that Ferrer's physique wasn't the conventional movie star physical of the time, as the same Times profile describes Ferrer's physique in a very shaming way. His hair is thinning, he has big ears, a large nose, and although he's not far, two chins both of which recede, he has narrow shoulders, a wide chest, and a long waist, and short legs on which the right is longer than the other. He's 5-10 inches old, but manages to look smaller by slouching. You might say, remark another actor whose profile is impeccable, that he's ugly in a distinguished sort of way, or, he added, distinguished in an ugly sort of way. Whatever it was, not even Ferrer himself could point out why his stardom died so abruptly. In an interview he gave two years before his death, he said, I thought I had a God-given right to a glittering career, it started off so well and so effortlessly, I was shocked when it ended so abruptly. I couldn't understand what I've done wrong and I still can't. 
Today, not even Ferrer's Oscar remains as proof of this historical moment in the history of Hollywood and film. In the year 2000, the University of Puerto Rico was renovating its theater when the Oscar was misplaced and stolen. Ferrer's son, Miguel, also an actor, said that he contacted the Academy for a replacement and was willing to pay for it, but their position was, if it's lost or stolen and the guy's alive, we replaced it, if the guy's dead, it's too bad, reported the Hollywood Reporter. Yet, Oscar or no Oscar, Ferrer will forever be known in history as the first. He not only was the first Hispanic actor to win the Oscar, but the first actor to ever win a Tony Award for Best Actor, and in 1985, he became the first actor to receive the National Medal of Arts. If we can learn anything about his story, is that an actor can be as prepared and as complete as Ferrer was and still not secure longevity in a business like Hollywood. Yet his pitfalls are now lessons and he demonstrated that it's possible for more generations to come.